quantum mechanics, non-locality, measurement problem, weak measurements, and foundational aspects of quantum mechanics. Welcome, Professor Metzkin, to the QIQT workshop. Uh, you have 50 you. minutes for the presentation, followed by 10 minutes of question answer session. You may please so, begin. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. So uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, Professor Panigrahi. And uh, I will just try to share the screen. Right, so I hope you see my screen. Um, so the, the, the talk will yes, be- it, it's Yes, it's visible, yes. It's visible, so thank you. So I, I, will, I will give you a talk uh, on some issues regarding relativistic quantum mechanics and more, more specifically uh, something that appears as apparently paradoxical when you look at traversal times in when you have the tunnel effect in uh, for the, the Klein-Gordon equation. So I will explain this. Uh, so there will be no suspense in the sense that you will see that this apparent paradox will be solved. It will be solved by another paradox, which is well known uh, in the field. So this work was mostly done with um, uh, Mohamed Al-Khatib, who is uh, now finishing uh, his PhD here in, in, uh, in Sergi. And, um, and a few collaborators that I will mention at the end of the talk. Um, so uh, let me... Uh, briefly give you the outline of the talk. So first I will uh, recall, I mean, remind you the basics of tunneling, something that I think all of you have learned, uh, you know, when you take the first quantum mechanics course, uh, potential scattering, uh, you know, a step potential, that kind of thing. Uh, then we, we will see that things work pretty much the same, or at least appear to work pretty much the same when you take a relativistic particle. So then it doesn't obey the Schrodinger equation, but the Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, but but it, I mean, there are some subtleties that I will briefly mention the subtleties. And, uh, but, but other than that, it, it, it should work the same. Nevertheless, there is something that people have seen uh, when they started to, 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 to mix you know, quantum mechanics with relativity at the end of the 1920s, and, and this was uh, was called uh, the Klein Paradox. I will briefly mention what the Klein Paradox is about. And then we will uh, see what happens when you launch, uh, well, well you, you, you launch a particle against a potential barrier. This is basically what I will be, I will be talking in this, uh, in this presentation. It's, it's a, you have a, a particle, you launch it a, a, a barrier of a finite width, and then you uh, look uh, what is uh, transmitted across the barrier. And uh, we will see that if we just uh, do things the usual way, uh, then we have some sort of a paradox uh, that the particle crosses the barrier in a, a superluminal way. And this is of course uh, a problem. Uh, if you, you, know, if you think that you have a relativistic framework, you, you don't want to see that. And uh, so, so, so the, the, the reminder of the talk will be uh, devoted to, you know, um, understanding why we have this, this apparent paradox and, and how we can solve it. Uh, first, I will, well, most, most of, of the time, I will just stay at the level of first quantized uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. And, and I will also just briefly give you a glimpse of how this paradox is resolved uh, within a quantum field theory uh, approach. So uh, basics of tunneling. So so so. Um, let me get this uh, pointer. So you know the Schrodinger equation. Uh, you're familiar with the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Remember that uh, when you you learn about this uh, equation, you you had you know, the simplest example you were given is is the step potential. So the potential is zero in this region here, and it's constant to the right of uh, of this point. Let's let this point x equals zero and uh, you uh, launch a particle with the energy below uh, v0 otherwise it would just go above and and, and as you know you uh, in this case of the step potential uh, you will have uh, your particle reflected so, so how do you solve this problem well you you start with a plane wave and uh, here uh, you write the expression for the plane wave on this side and this region then you write the expression for the plane wave in this region and you match them at uh, uh, the, the, this point you match the wave function and its first derivative since uh, the Schrodinger equation is of second order uh, and the spatial derivative 
And, and this is how you get uh, the solution to, to your you know, very simple potential scattering problem. So now uh, on, on the right on this side, I have a barrier uh, instead of a step, but it works pretty much the same. So you see the potential is uh, zero on, on both sides of the barrier and uh, L is the width. And, and again, uh, you will uh, launch your particle and part of it will be reflected and part of it will be transmitted. And, and so as you probably remember the, the transmitted part is very, very, very small. And again, the, the idea is that you have now three regions, uh, one here, one inside the barrier, one to the right of the barrier, and uh, you match the wave function and its first derivative at the uh, points of discontinuity here. Well, because here we have a discontinuous potential. Uh, otherwise you, you, you have to match the um, uh, wave function in the asymptotic regions. Uh, so uh, here we have the detail of, of the matching uh, process. So here I, I have the three regions, one, two, three, right here I have my barrier drawn in uh, red. And I represent here my plane wave, uh, or rather the, the real part, if you want, of the plane wave in region one. And uh, as uh, you remember, this uh, would be the uh, momentum of the plane wave uh, in regions one and three, because it's just, you know, uh, a, 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 a just free propagation, right? A free particle. Uh, inside the barrier, however, uh, the uh, momentum takes this form. So I think you're very familiar with this expression, E minus V. And uh, as uh, we uh, assumed the energy was below the potential, E minus V, is negative, and so this gives me uh, an imaginary momentum. And, and, and in terms of the wave function of the plane wave, here it oscillates, here it's going to decrease exponentially because the momentum is imaginary, and, and then it will go out and again oscillate in region three. And, and so since we have an exponential uh, decrease inside the barrier, the, the, the amplitude will be very, very small. So basically uh, what we do in order to get the, the, the amplitudes uh, of the wave, uh, so I didn't write it here, but it's here. So just, just a look at the, the expression here between parentheses. So, so you remember we have this expression in uh, region one, where J is, is then equal to one in region two and region three. And we will match as specified here, uh, 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 the, the, the wave functions in each region uh, at points X equals zero and points X equals L. And this is how we get uh, the, these amplitudes. Uh, so we have to choose the boundary condition. Um, so, so, so if we have an incoming wave, we will, we will say that uh, the, the wave associated with this motion is one, and then we will say that the, motion, the wave associated with this motion is zero because there's no contribution. We just have an incoming uh, particle this way. And this is how we retrieve uh, all the other amplitudes, the, the, the you know, B1, uh, A2, B2, and uh, A3. A3 is the transmitted uh, amplitude. So uh, this holds for uh, plane waves, and now we can build a wave packet with that. So uh, I guess you are familiar um, with uh, with the wave packet. Um, so 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 you just uh, build your wave packet from uh, uh, your uh, plane waves. So I will. Just, I think I have added some more stuff in another file. Let me just check one second if I can uh, if I can find the other stuff I have added. Okay, so I can't find it. So let's let's resume from here. Right. So 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 here is how we build the wave packet. Right. So 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 um, this gives you the wave packet as. Uh, so, so the G's here uh, are related to the uh, momentum representation uh, contributions of the initial wave packet. So, so in this case, uh, sorry, I, I'm just trying to get my pointer back. Uh, here it is. Uh, right, so, you, so, so at equal zero, you would get the wave packet uh, at equal zero. So, so typically can be a Gaussian. Uh, for example, or something you know that is pretty much localized, and then you just evolve it in time, and this is how you get uh, your wave packet propagating. And then uh, here it scatters uh, at, at the left edge of the barrier. Part of it is uh, reflected, part is transmitted inside, and then at the end, part is uh, really transmitted uh, outside. So as you might know, there are a lot of 
controversies regarding the tunneling time, which would be like, how long uh, does a wave packet spend inside the barrier? So, so the problem is that um, the, the time is more or less well-defined if you have a, a nice wave packet that has this type of shape, because you just look at the group velocity and it's more or less the velocity of the peak. And, and then you can define uh, the velocity of the wave packet. But now when you are inside the barrier, you have, a, 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 you know, a, you just sum over exponential uh, functions and, and your wave packet is kind of uh, loses it, its shape. And it's, it's very hard to, to uh, it, I mean, you have different definitions of, of velocities inside the, the, the barrier. And this is pretty much controversial. This, this is the only thing I can say for the moment. But what is less controversial is that the wave packet at some point will, uh, I mean, a part of the wave packet will be transmitted. It's, a, it's a very small because of the reasons we, we mentioned before. But it turns out that in, in typical cases, the wave packet that is transmitted seems to go faster than the one you would have without the barrier. So here you have just free propagation. You launch a wave packet with some initial mean momentum in this direction, it just moves and slightly spreads and uh, arrives at, uh, here at time t, e, t f. And if you just think uh, that you will have a barrier here and uh, you will see that your transmitted wave packet will be very small, but its peak will be uh, advanced relative to the one that uh, propagates uh, freely. So of course, since uh, we have the Schrodinger equation, you can choose an arbitrarily high uh, momentum, initial momentum. And uh, you can have superluminal transmission in the sense that the, 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 uh, the peak here will, be, uh, will, will go faster, will arrive earlier, depending on uh, the, the view you have. And, and it can be superluminal, but there's nothing um, uh, surprising because the Schrodinger equation doesn't know anything about the light velocity. And uh, you can, you know, if you have a very high momentum, uh, you will have, uh, you will associate with a very high momentum, a very high velocity. It can be superluminal, and that's not. That's not a problem. I mean, this is a, it, it just tells you that you are using your theory uh, wh where it is not applicable. So let's now jump to uh, the Klein Gordon equation, uh, which, as you know, describes spin uh, zero bosons. So, um, how do you get um, the Klein Gordon equation? Well, you start uh, from the relation between, you know, you just write the energy, uh, just exactly as you do with the Schrodinger equation, right? The energy is equal to uh, the Hamiltonian. And then you, uh, you apply uh, canonical quantization, means E, you associate A, I, H bar uh, D, DT, delta derivative of T, and with the momentum minus I, H bar uh, DX. So this is something you know, and this is how uh, by just applying a kind of quantization to uh, the, en the, 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 the energy expression, you get the klein gordon equation, except that, uh, yeah, I want, so, so this is a potential term, so I, I, it shouldn't be here because I'm just quantizing the free, uh, yeah, the, the, the free klein gordon equation. So, so this would be the potential. If you, if you uh, quantize with the potential, this is what you would get, but just for the moment, forget about the potential. And because you have E squared, you have an equation that is second order in time. And um, and then when you look for the, the, the density and the conserved current, you find that the density expression uh, takes this form and this form is different from the, the usual, uh, you know, uh, uh, psi, psi uh, com complex conjugate or psi absolute value mod squared. Uh, so, so, uh, so this, this, the fact that the, density uh, has a special derivative uh, term uh, comes from the fact that klein gordon equation is second order in time. So this changes a lot of things in terms of the, the uh, mathematics. From the physical point of view, the, the main issue here is that the density is uh, not necessarily positive. It can be negative. And this was seen as a problem in the early days of quantum mechanics, but pretty uh, quickly people understood this was related to the charge. Uh, so positive charge uh, density is associated with particles and negative charge density is associated with antiparticles. And the point is that over, even though the, the, the global charge can be positive, you can have uh, some regions of space, a charge, uh, a, the charge can be negative. So, so, so uh, this means that typically, uh, you know, your quantum mechanical state uh, psi uh, will intrinsically describe a superposition of particles. That's the regions where rho would be positive and antiparticles, which is the region where rho would be negative. Uh, right. 
Uh, so the, the plane wave solutions, um, well, uh, they're exactly the same as, as, uh, as for the Schrodinger equation, except that now E can be negative. Uh, if you, you can also build a wave packet in the same way, except that uh, since uh, the equation is second order in time, we have to choose the initial time and also the, the first derivative uh, at t equals zero. Now, it, it is very um, practical, especially if you do computations to write the Klein Gordon equation. It's called Hamilton form because then it's a first order in time uh, equation. So this is what it looks like. Uh, so, so the tau's here are, are, are Pauli matrices. So now they're called, you know, especially in the context of quantum information, they would just write sigma, sigma three, sigma two, and here's sigma three. At the time uh, when, when, when the, the, these equations were found, obtained in the 1950s, uh, they just wrote tau for the, the Pauli matrices. Uh, psi now is a two component wave function. That's, uh, the diff that, that, that's what you gain or lose if you go from the second, you know, the, the, the canonical form, second order in time, uh, which is here to the first order in time, then uh, you have a, a wave function that has two components. But what is nice is that now the density, which is exactly the same as the one, the expression I gave you before, uh, can be written as the absolute value of phi squared minus chi squared, so which are the two components uh, of the uh, wave function. And so you see that one component always gives positive uh, density and the other component always gives negative density. So it's, it's very neat associate you know, uh, uh, each component with, with particle contribution or anti-particle contribution. Okay, um, so now let's, let's get to, to, to the Klein paradox. So um, what, what people realize early on is that if you had the potential step, you know, which is again, the, the simplest uh, thing you can think of after the, the, the just free propagation, and you launch initially, uh, you know, some um, plane wave with with a, with a given amplitude, which is here in red, and then you look at what is reflected, which is here in in blue. Um, then people realize that the uh, amplitude of the reflected wave was higher than the amplitude of the incident wave, and of course this this was a was paradoxical because you know it's like you launched one particle and then uh, you, you you had two particles reflected. Uh, so so this is it became let's say well understood. Uh, so so this happens first for what is called what is known as supercritical potentials. So so potentials that are very high, larger than two mc squared, and and. Um, and here's what uh, is really happening. So remember that uh, what I have to do here is write the wave function in, in zone one and the wave function in zone two. So here I just have uh, the momentum P, but in zone two I have now, instead of having, uh, you know, square root of two M uh, E minus V zero, this is what I had in uh, the non-relativistic case. Now I have uh, the relativistic uh, energy. And so, so as you may see, this is again imaginary if uh, V zero is, let's say not too big, because then this term becomes more important and I will get you know, the usual behavior, the ones you're used to with the Schrodinger equation. But now if V0 is very large, uh, then as you can see, this term will always, always be real. And in this case, instead of having exponentially decreasing solutions uh, or totally reflecting uh, situation, I will have uh, oscillatory solutions inside, inside the region of the potential. And this is how you explain uh, the, the, the fact that the reflection amplitude is higher than the one of the incident wave, uh, because uh, what, what you have here is negative charge is created inside uh, the step potential. And since the total charge is conserved, this means that a positive charge has to be created outside and, and, that, and, and then it becomes the uh, charge of the particle that is reflected. Uh, so this is why, since you have uh, oscillating solutions inside the step, they have to be associated with antiparticles. This gives you negative charge created and uh, the, 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 since the total charge is conserved, you will have uh, this uh, additional charge and, and, and it will give you a higher amplitude for um, you reflected the wave function. So uh, this again is, 
uh, first quantized framework. So I haven't mentioned anything about particle, antiparticle uh, pair creation, as you would expect from a quantum field theory approach. And uh, this is time paradox was, was I mean, it, it's a bit hard to understand. So, 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 so people thought they understood and not understood. You have some textbook which uh, actually give a, a bad account of, of, of what's really happening. So, so it's still, um, it's still being discussed uh, with different levels of approximation. But let's say at the, at the level of, of uh, first quantized theory, I think there is no um, problem for bosons to, to understand what is happening. For fermions, it's a bit different, but here I'm just focusing on uh, bosons. So uh, what we're doing now is, um, uh, instead of having a step, we have a barrier. And we have the klein gordon equation because we are uh, describing a relativistic uh, spin zero boson. And we want to, want to, like, to, to do exactly uh, the same uh, thing you are used to with the Schrodinger equation. So I want to know what is going to be uh, transmitted across this barrier. And uh, I'm doing exactly the same thing uh, we have seen with the Schrodinger equation that you remember. Uh, so, so, so again, I have the asymptotic conditions, which just means that this incoming uh, term will be one. I match wave functions uh, in the different regions here and here. And then uh, I get the amplitudes, the A's you see here, this is how I get them, and especially the, the, the transmitted, uh, the amplitude of the transmitted uh, wave packet, well, here plane wave, and then I will construct the wave packet from these plane waves by just uh, superposing all these plane waves with some uh, you know, uh, coefficient that reflects the, the choice of your wave packet. So this is very nice, but um, if I do this, uh, I mean, it's very nice and it's basically what people tend to do. I mean, it's, you, don't have, uh, 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 so you don't have many papers in the sense that this is not experimentally feasible. At, uh, you know, at current times you need, uh, to create fields with very a very high energy, and and we still can do this, especially for bosons. So we have very very high energy, uh, but but still you have some papers looking at the theory. Uh, you know what you what, what you could obtain uh, in terms of transmission rates if you if you send uh, bosons on on the type of barriers. So 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 you would just tend to match the uh, wave function at the boundary right, the boundary conditions as we saw here and. Uh, and then look at the transmitted coefficient. So this is the, the, the amplitude of the transmitted uh, plane wave. And from there, deduce the, the transmission rate. Now, if you take a wave packet with this, uh, just as we did with the Schrodinger equation, you have an acausal behavior, which uh, means that uh, uh, the tunneling time is negative in the sense that the wave packet goes out of the barrier even before uh, it has fully entered the barrier. So let me show you an example here. So what you see in, uh, uh, so the barrier is, is the region, the barrier is the region between the dashed lines here in red. So here is the t equals zero situation. You just have a Gaussian uh, wave packet here. So it's launched with some mean momentum in this direction. So it will impinge on uh, the barrier. Now, as the wave packet starts to arrive uh, and touches, let's say the right edge of the barrier, you see that something happens on the right edge of the barrier. And, uh, and here, so the, something is actually leaving uh, the barrier. Uh, at, 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 it's leaving the barrier, but uh, it has not, the, the incoming wave packet has not fully crossed the barrier yet. So here you see negative charge inside the barrier because um, the, you have antiparticles because the, the energy is negative. So, so remember what we just saw here. So this would be the energy inside the barrier. It's E minus V and uh, we require here V to be larger so 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 the energy is negative and then we have antiparticles so this is why you see a negative uh, charge here and, okay and then and then your wave packet just leaves so so if we some uh, summarize the situation this is what you have so a free wave packet so here you have an initial wave packet and then uh, imagine there's no barrier you have the green one it arrives at some time in arbitrary time we choose it arrives at, at this position and uh, now with standard tunneling, I just told you that on relativistic uh, Schrodinger equation, then, then you would have the, the tunneled wave packet would arrive, uh, would go faster than, than the free one. So you would be here at this position. And now with the relativistic wave packet and the supercritical potential, you would arrive uh, even earlier or at some frozen time, definite time here, you would 
go quite uh, farther from the barrier. And uh, of course, you see that there is a problem because uh, you wouldn't expect superluminal transmission uh, for a relativistic wave equation. So, so um, why does that happen? Well, a few people observe this effect. And uh, what they typically say, and this is what typically tend to say, oh, it's because uh, we are using a first quantized theory. And if we used a uh, quantum field, relativistic quantum field theory, we, we, wouldn't, ex we wouldn't obtain this. This is you know, probably due to some uh, weird effect uh, of first quantized theory. So it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's true that if you do QFT, you will not, uh, you will not find this, but, but actually the, the problem is not there. And this is what I want to explain uh, now and, and, and see how we can solve within uh, first quantized uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, the problem. Um, so the, the idea now um, is to look, you know, to, to break the scattering amplitude into um, individual events. So what do I mean by this? Uh, well, here I have my incoming wave, my incoming particle represented by a plane wave. Uh, it reaches the left edge of the barrier here. So you see that one part is going to be reflected and the other part transmitted. So this would be just like having a step at this point. Now, if I look at the transmitted part, uh, then it's going to travel inside the barrier, reach uh, the right edge. And at this point, well, uh, one part uh, of the wave function is going to be transmitted and another part reflected. And now, of course, uh, you see that, okay, so you understand that T is transmitted. The index R here uh, means at the right edge. The index here means at the left edge. I is because it's the incident wave going from left to right. And O is the... Uh, um, outgoing, so, 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 so wave going from right to left. So you see that this uh, reflected uh, wave packet, well, sorry, the so reflected amplitude here is going to be here, arrives at the left edge and it's going to be transmitted and reflected and so on and so on and so on. So the idea is now, okay, uh, this process, I mean, is uh, controversial, I can do this. And uh, in principle, I can obtain my famous amplitudes, you know, the, the, the A2, B2, A3, and in each region by just summing the different contributions because, you know, by linear superposition, uh, if I sum all these things, I will get my uh, amplitude. So this is what uh, you can see on the left. So again, I choose my uh, incident uh, amplitude to be one, uh, which is the one that, that, which represents the particle that is arriving at, uh, towards the barrier, and then I compute all the other uh, amplitudes, scattering amplitudes. And so, so this is the form it takes. And now the only thing we need to do is compute the individual um, Rs and Ts you see here. And this is just uh, easy because it's just this, it, it represents like two individual steps. And so, so this is something we can do. And what we realize is that uh, the, ser the series diverge actually. And so uh, matching the wave function will not make any sense because you will just have infinity equals infinity. Now, when the series converge, uh, then you can indeed match uh, the wave functions jointly. So match jointly means match the wave function uh, here and here, the, the, the wave function in their uh, first derivatives. But now in this case, the series diverge. And so, so what we did uh, with the Schrodinger equation uh, cannot be done here because uh, precisely the series diverge. So it's interesting maybe to, to have a quick look uh, why they diverge. So, so if you take, for example, typically they, they, they would look like this. So the, 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 uh, the amplitudes just depend on the differences um, between the, the momentum in, in the two uh, regions. And the, the reason they diverge is this something I haven't mentioned, but uh, for example, you know that P, uh, the momentum is taken positive, uh, sorry, is taken positive uh, when the wave propagates from left to right. This is a convention. But for antiparticles, uh, Q is, when Q is positive, they travel the other way around. They travel from right to left. And so this is what makes the series divergent is that this Q here is negative. So this is, uh, it becomes uh, greater than one. And when you sum all, all of these guys here, uh, then you just obtain infinite quantities. So basically, uh, series are divergent because we have antiparticles, and this is what makes the, the, the momentum 
uh, sign opposite to the one it has for particles. So this is really uh, uh, due to the fact that you, you, you have antiparticles and you cannot, uh, I mean, you have to deal with antiparticles in, in a relativistic uh, setting. This is what Klein tunneling is about. Uh, <clears throat> So, of course, uh, you will tell me, okay, we started from this, you know, time uh, stationary, let's say, plane waves, and we have uh, infinite uh, quantities, okay, uh, but, uh, I mean, are they useful? Well, yes, because, you know, in, in the real physical situation, you're dealing with uh, finite times, so this means that you would have, uh, n would not go to infinity, infinity, but you know, would, would be just uh, a finite number. And actually N represents the number of times uh, you, uh, your particle travels inside the barrier. So, so, so it hits one edge, two edges, three edges, and so on. And so when you build your wave packet, uh, you, can, you know you can uh, stop the sum here for at some finite value of N. So, so you can actually choose the one you want because uh, you can show that uh, the, the, the contribution with the nth contribution uh, formally uh, translates with your wave packet very, very far from the barrier. So, 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 so only the ones uh, up to some finite ends, uh, the ones you're using, some, the time, depending on the time you are computing your wave packet uh, is, is taken into account. Uh, so so the, the important thing here is to understand the physical meaning of, of these uh, oscillations, of these, uh, of, sorry, of these divergence. And the physical meaning is, of course, related to charge creation. Uh, so, so, so the fact that these amplitudes blow up means that each time you hit an edge of the barrier, more charge is created. Uh, so this is how basically uh, we can solve um, the, the paradox. So, 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 so the paradox of superluminal uh, traversal times is actually solved by the Klein paradox, which is charge creation uh, by supercritical potentials. So uh, how, how do we do this? So we write uh, the wave function. So this is the wave function written in the standard called canonical form of the klein golden equation. As I told you, we use this form here. Uh, which is the, 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 the so, so, so these are plane waves uh, of uh, the Hamilton form of the klein golden equation with first order in time. So, so as you can see, uh, the, the, this, this, this would be the, the, yeah, the prefactor uh, for a free wave. So it has both uh, positive, let's say, and negative uh, contributions. So, so here, plus and minus are just referred to negative and positive, well, positive and negative energies. So you feed all these uh, plane waves into your wave packet. So the wave packet is written here. And then, as I told you, you choose some a finite n in your sum that will depend on the time you are interested. Uh, you evolve your wave packet up to some time, to some time t, and this fixes uh, uh, the, the upper bound in the sum. And uh, we can now uh, look at uh, the results. So for the moment, let's just look at the black curve. Uh, forget about the red curve for now. So the barrier here is between zero and 400. So here it uh, appears uh, slightly grayed. And now you see the density. So I start with, uh, so again, forget about the red line. I start with some, uh, you know, particles, some boson, uh, positive uh, charge. So, so it's really a, a boson. And I choose, it's, I choose some momentum in, in this direction. So it's going to impinge on the barrier. So here it starts moving. Uh, so there's a, this little guy, maybe I will explain later if I have some time what this is. Uh, but, but, but you can see it's, it's interesting that this is negative, has negative charge, right? Uh, but, but the bulk of the wave packet moves towards the right, it's positive charge wave packet. And here it's, uh, by this time it reaches the barrier. And so as you can see here, uh, part of, of it is reflected because you see like interferences between the, the incoming and the reflected part and part of it is going to be transmitted. And when it's transmitted, it's, you see the black line here, it's negative, anti-particle as we expected. Um, in this uh, panel here, well, you see, the, the wave packet that is reflected. This one is actually moving in this direction. Uh, and here you see the wave packet inside of the tunnel, inside the barrier, which is tunneling, Klein tunneling, and it's negative, negative charge, because it's an antiparticle. I mean, it's a particle uh, contribution. 
Now, what you can see here is look at the at the scale. I started uh, with with a normalized uh, wave packet, charge one wave packet. So here's a scale minus one to one. I'm not doing anything other than just propagating the wave packet, and you see now that the scale uh, has changed. Why? Because uh, when it uh, scattered here in, on the barrier, uh, charge was created. So so positive charge was created. So so this this guy is higher and negative charge was created to compensate because the total charge is conserved, you see? And, and so this is why the, 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 the scale here is changing. Uh, okay, so now at even some later time, um, now the, the wave packet arrives at the right edge of the barrier. Part of it is going to be transmitted outside, part of it reflected. But again, look at the scale. You know, it's 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 thirty uh, times uh, larger than, than the initial uh, wave packet. So this is a zoom. This is a zoom uh, near the right edge of the barrier at, at the same of this wave packet you see here. Uh, and and so if you look, so uh, so again, only look at the black line, the black curve. Sorry, and uh, so you see that it's it's oscillating because it's 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 uh, there's an interference between the reflected uh, the, the part that is still incoming and the one reflected, but it's the charge is negative. Here uh, we are at the barrier edge, and it suddenly jumps to. Uh, to positive charge, which means you have the antiparticle here becomes a, a particle outside. Okay, and then uh, even larger times, and you can see that this process goes on and on. And look at the scale; uh, it's getting you know larger and larger. So, 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 so this is a um, typical amplification mechanism. So each time um, your wave packet uh, hits an edge, charge is created. Uh, part of it transmitted, part of it uh, reflected, and then uh, hits the other edge, and again, uh, more charges created, and so on. So, so, so uh, within the, the 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 model, of course, uh, this happens forever. In practice, uh, of course, as as more and more charges created, uh, you, you can't uh, just think that your your field will be strong enough, and uh, and uh, so so you will reach the the limit of the model. Right, so now um, a quick look at the red curve. So, so, so the, the black curve is the analytical wave packet. Uh, well, semi-analytical, uh, the wave packet is analytical, but we still need to do the, numer the integrations numerically. We can also solve the clan gordon equation uh, through a finite difference scheme. So this is a purely numerical scheme, which is a little bit uh, uh, subtle to, to, to find the, the correct parameters. But uh, once it works, you see you have perfect agreement between our wave packet approach and a finite, uh, purely numerical uh, scheme. And of course, uh, when you do the, the, the wave packet, the dynamical approach, you understand really what's going on. You understand why your wave packet is uh, increasing in amplitude and, and, uh, and, and the different features uh, of the dynamics. So, um, in this case, uh, we, we see that the process is fully causal. You have the, the incoming wave packet, it's going inside the barrier, it's reflecting, it's going out. And, and then of course you have several uh, wave, uh, transmitted wave packets since the, the inside the charge is oscillating, but there's now no superluminal anything. So everything is causal and this is due to charge creation. Um, so we know that uh, what was creating the problem was that we were using joint matching conditions that do not hold uh, if your scattering expansions diverge. So this is the kind of the uh, moral of, of, of the story. So before uh, closing a quick, uh, uh, a few words on the resolution of the paradox uh, through a QFT approach. Uh, so, 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 of course, fundamentally, if you have a supercritical barrier, then you will have, uh, you're, you're creating pairs, the background, background field, which is actually giving the potential is creating uh, pairs from the vacuum. So this is why uh, QFT approach is, is really the correct uh, thing to do. Uh, so I just, uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so I'm supposed to be talking about bosons and I'm showing a plot for fermions, I'm sorry, but, but the, 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 the same thing is, I mean, the plots would be identical for bosons. Uh, so this is just pair creation from vacuum. We don't have any incoming particle. We just have uh, here uh, a potential uh, barrier, which is supercritical. And so as you can see, as it is supercritical, electrons are created uh, outside and ejected uh, to the left. Uh, of, of the left edge and inside uh, positrons. So in our case, it would be bosons uh, and anti-bosons inside and bosons outside. And this is symmetric since our barrier is symmetric. So, um, uh, so this is what would happen 
just you know just the potential the barrier uh, without anything uh, incoming so now on top of this we want to launch uh, a boson towards the barrier and this is going to interplay with pair creations so, so we have um, a computational scheme uh, that, that uh, computes the the density uh, the spatial density of bosons or anti bosons and I don't want to get into the details uh, just very quickly, just to kind of give you an idea of what we are doing. So we have uh, the bosonic field operator. So this is the standard representation in terms of uh, annihilation and creation operators. Uh, so here I call the free solutions uh, phi and var phi for the positive and negative free solutions respectively. And uh, the tricky thing is to uh, express the time dependence of the uh, field operators in terms of uh, things you can actually compute. So, so this is what is done here. Your, your um, time dependent uh, annihilation and creation operators are given in terms of the evolution operator of the involving first quantized uh, wave functions. So this is the the um, so, so it involves a few approximations, but this is the way uh, the quantities we are interested in. So the spatial density is computed. <clears throat> so once you have these uh, these things, you need the initial wave packet, which I can write uh, exactly as in the first quantized. Uh, uh, I mean, I can take the same wave packet as in the quant first quantized formalism, except that now I write it in terms of creation operators. And so the spatial density I'm interested is the thing created uh, by the field. So Psi dagger Psi gives you a density as you, as you remember if you have taken an AQFT class. And I do this, uh, uh, the, uh, and I take the expectation value of this Psi dagger Psi uh, in uh, the state in which I have uh, an initial wave packet. And so this is uh, how um, we can compute uh, the following uh, process here. So I just represented the uh, Gaussian uh, here. This is slightly. This is a, this is not at t equals zero because at t equals zero, you, let's say you turn on the fields, you would have no uh, pair production of bosons and anti bosons. So this is slightly after at t equals zero, but your uh, wave packet is coming <clears throat> towards the barrier. You already have bosons and anti bosons. I represent the anti bosons with a negative charge uh, here. Uh, to do the same thing as we had with the first quantized formalism. So as the wave packet here arrives, uh, you see that more bosons are created outside the barrier and more anti-bosons are created inside the barrier. And, uh, and then the only thing you have uh, is that your uh, boson wave packet, let's say, uh, adds coherently to the uh, bosons and anti-bosons produced by the supercritical potential. This is what you see, uh, what you see here. Uh, you have the the the, the what what the, the wave packet and uh, the first quantized uh, formalism just uh, is the, the the thing you add on top of uh, the boson anti boson production. So so now it's traveling inside the barrier and look again at the scale. We started uh, with the scale you see here and now we 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 the scale of course has to increase because you have more and more and more charge that is produced and this is a, an amplification mechanism. And uh, so, so you have an exponential increase. So it blows, just blows up. Okay, so now uh, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, we, we are at the conclusion uh, step. So I just want to uh, emphasize, you know, the main uh, take home message. So we, we first, uh, <clears throat> first thing to say is that we had this apparent superluminality paradox. So, so things look to be not causal, but this was due to the, let's say, inappropriate use of matching condition. Um, what uh, is instrumental here is charge creation. So this is, it first appeared in the form of, of the kind paradox. And uh, it, it it's happens in several instances. If you do like, uh, if, if you look at relativistic QFT, uh, causality is restored if, if you include, uh, you know, both the particle and anti-particle sectors, you need, you need charge creation to restore causality. Uh, that works for the propagators. And if you look at the path integrals and in this context here, uh, it's because we, we, we have to include the charge creation um, <clears throat> uh, by, provoked by the, 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 the potential. 
So, so, so this is like the main message is causality needs anti anti particles. Otherwise, it doesn't work, and of, also need the correct commutation relations. But this is uh, not something we have seen here. Another take home message is that if you start with time independent arguments, then um, it's not uh, always easy to understand what is going on. So, so, so here you have stationary plane waves, and you would. Uh, uh, just find that uh, things are infinite and you wouldn't be able to go very far with that. So, so it's important like to include uh, the dynamical aspects, especially uh, with, with a kind with paradox, which is, uh, uh, you know, very, had been, a, has still is controversial. And, and part of the controversy is that people discuss uh, just, you know, arguments with plain waves and that's, it's hard to uh, know exactly what one is doing uh, correctly or not with plain waves. So uh, in terms of QFT, okay, we know the potential creates particles and that the, 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 the incoming wave packet enhances the particle and antiparticle creation. But in, in terms of the first quantized theory, uh, we have charge creation. It's also, it also comes with the first quantized theory. So, so it's funny because formally you're just describing one particle with uh, the, the same global total charge, but uh, with a spatially dependent charge that is, you know, increasing. Yes. Yeah, and goes on as you have this uh, interesting that the first quantized uh, relativistic wave equations are already equipped uh, with with the charge creation. And, um, I think it's also an interesting message to take home. So I just want to mention that parts of these results were done in collaboration with a group in, in Bilbao, uh, Dmitry Sokolovsky, Marisa Ponce, and Javier Gutierrez de la Cal. And here are some references um, if you are interested in going further. So I think time is almost up and I would like to thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to the talk. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you so much. Well, thank most you. of the participants uh, are students and I'm sure they have enjoyed uh, listening to you. Uh, now we shall take some questions. There are a few in your chat box if you could just read them. Sure. Uh, Okay, so the first question is concerning so superluminal. Uh, so, so I think I answered, so that's, that was maybe at the beginning of the talk. So I think now the answer is that, it, that there's nothing uh, superluminal, right? Uh, if, you, if you do the things appropriately and there is no experimental evidence because we cannot yet create fields high enough uh, to see this, I mean, at least in terms of elementary particles. So for the moment, uh, for fermions, it, it, it could be possible in the next decade. For bosons, probably not, but for fermions, it, things work uh, differently. So, so um, yeah, so this is as, as far as the first question. Um, so the second question, I'm not sure I understand. It is possible to show supercritical fields using Klein Gordon paradox. Uh, so, I think. Okay, so I don't know exactly what, what uh, uh, Derendra meant in this question. Uh, so I don't know if he or she wants to yeah, uh, if, specify. Yeah, you can. Otherwise, uh, yeah. yeah, or maybe you can, you know. Uh, okay, well, I can, I can just say on. that, yes, that kind of paradox is, uh, is related to, I mean, is intrinsically uh, related to supercritical fields because it's, uh, uh, Supercritical, you need supercritical fields in order to uh, enhance uh, the pair creation mechanism and in order to see that the reflected uh, wave packet is uh, larger than the one you originally sent. Um, so then how to define time dependent charge in the first quantized setting? So the charge is, is actually just the, the, the density. It's just a charge density. So you have the total charge, which, which is rho integrated over all space. And this is constant, uh, is a constant, the charge is conserved. And then you have uh, the rho xt, so which means that, you know, just as you have the, 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 the density with the Schrodinger equation, your density, uh, you know, psi, psi mod squared depends on x and on t. Well, here you have the same uh, thing. A row depends on X and T, and in some regions it can be positive, in others negative. And uh, the, 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 the important thing is, is that uh, even if you start with a, a positive uh, charge, you will have always some negative charge in some regions. If you start, let's say, with a localized positive state, or even with an arbitrary uh, superposition of plane waves, which are all positive, you will necessarily have 
regions in which the, the, the charge is negative. So this is a problem like for people that do, um, well, Bohmian mechanics because they, they can't really handle negative uh, densities with formalism. And so this is why uh, it is often said that uh, for Bohmian uh, mechanics, uh, you, ca you can't have trajectories for bosons. You have to do something different, a field theory and so on. Um, so then the question about uh, spin zero and spin one half systems. Uh, so does relativistic quantum mechanics defines? So, um, uh, so one thing you can do, I mean, of course, if, if you really want to, to, to understand well, the, you know, spin issues, then, then you need to go to QFT and, and then you have one no, uh, form of the equations. So you take the Dirac equations and you do the, the, the limit uh, with a small velocities, then you will have uh, you know, the Schrodinger Pauli equation that describes uh, spin one half. So, so this is something you can do, but I'm not sure you can really intrinsically uh, see the spin issues at the level of first quantized uh, quantum mechanics. So uh, the semi-analytical wave packet. So I'm saying it's semi-analytical because the wave packet, uh, you just, you know, it's just, uh, you write it analytically, but you have just integrals to do. So I, if you remember my integral over P, uh, this thing, I, I can't do it analytically. I have to do it numerically. So this is why I call it semi-analytical because the, the integrals, I still have to uh, do them numerically. But this is different from solving uh, from uh, first principles, the equation numerically in which you just uh, discretize time and space and you, you do finite difference uh, in order to, to solve the, uh, the equation. So this is why it's semi-analytical because I still need to do uh, numerics. Uh, so I don't know if uh, my answers were clear enough or if anyone wants to yeah, ask. Yeah, it's anything. fine. Are there fine. more questions in the, in the chat box? Are there more questions in the chat box? That's it, no. Okay, no. okay, fine. Well, if any of the participants has any question, then you can also get in touch with Professor Matkins later on via email and uh, seek clarification yeah, sure. on any point. Okay, thanks a lot once again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Right. We, we now conclude this. Yeah. Okay. We now conclude this session. I thank everyone for their participation. Over to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you.
Alors, ok. Ok, should I share my screen or? Uh... Ok. Hello, hello, Professor Asin. Hello, how are you? Hi, this is Prabha. Yeah. Uh, so, are the uh, organizers here? Can, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, ok. So, they said we'll start in a few minutes. So, maybe we just wait a few more minutes. Yeah, sure, no problem. Can you see my screen or in the slides? Yes. Okay. Okay, maybe I stop sharing and Um, should we start? I with me. Okay, good. I okay. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to welcome you all for this concluding session of 